And so now we are be starting to introduce to all of these different people who are in John. So who are some of the people? We know it's Nicodemus. We know that it is a uh, man at the Pool of Bethesda, right? But in this specific chapter, who is the person who we get introduced to? Nicodemus, Nicodemus. that's right. Yes. <laughs> that's Nicodemus. Not even you write Nicodemus for us up here. Okay, so John chapter three. <laughs> There was a man of the Pharisees. When we, go, when we go through this, we are going to dissect these verses, not only in style, but I want to also dissect it as far as why do you think that um, God allowed these to be written the way that he did? Not only that, we want to also look at context. We're going to be looking at a lot of different things, okay? So there was a man of the Pharisees, we're in John chapter 3, starting with verse 1, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Some important pieces stand out here about Nicodemus. First of all, who is he? Ruler of the Jews. Absolutely. Can you write that for me? When he's a ruler of the Jews, what does that mean? He was a what? King. Okay. Rabbi. King. Rabbi. He was, he was a teacher, exactly. He was a teacher. He was an overseer. He was like a, one of the master teachers there, okay? But another thing stands out about Nicodemus. Who was he? He was a, what do we hear? He was a what? And who else? What else was he? Mm, Let me read it again. There was a man of the Pharisees it's named true. Nicodemus, a ruler of the oh, Jews. Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, he was a Pharisee. That word is going to be important. And Nadia, if you can circle that. That word's going to be important because as we go through and we listen to what Jesus tells him, I, I you're, going yes. see, I you're going to see. Yes. <laughs> you're going to see what ends up happening as we go through this a little bit more, okay? Nice. When you read this, true. when you all read this this She's week, and you thought about a little bit about this book, what are some things that jumped out to you just from reading this? I think the conversation, the overall conversation, the way that God was just, you know, John was talking to him, so mm -hmm. they were so candid, you know, with one another, and you could even hear how Jesus was like, they had placed exclamations or, or you know, even an expectation in um, the question or the response. So, I mean, I think it was just like that, ca that not a casual conversation, but just the, the ease of the conversation, honestly. Okay. It was more like a conversation versus a, you know, talking to someone like with a directive or okay. something like that. Okay, okay. So there was a lot of conversation. I, I would say... Uh, I don't know how to best describe it, but well, with Nicodemus, almost like a questionable sincerity, I guess. I'm trying, to, trying to figure out how sincere he really, really is. Okay. That's important, too, uh, sincerity, Nicodemus' sincerity. Okay. So let's go on further, verse 2. Someone read that for me, please. So we read verse 1. Read verse 2 for me. Good evening. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Ooh, what does this tell you about Nicodemus's character? I'm going to actually specifically partner you up with someone, because when I ask you to partner, sometimes you all don't always do it. <laughs> so I'm going to ask uh, Natalie and um, Arlene to partner. Can I ask you, you two to partner? <laughs> Can I ask Dan and Sister Agnes to partner? Can I ask Morgan and uh, Sister Ingrid to partner? Can I ask you two to partner? And then can I ask you two to partner? Okay, here's the question again. Here's the question. Nicodemus, when we were looking at Nicodemus, what are some things that it said uh, that can tell you about who Nicodemus is? What did he say? What are some things that he did? What are some things that tell you about the character of Nicodemus based on just that verse? There are some things that you hear about Nicodemus based on that verse. On your mark, just verse it said two. just verse two. And time. Okay, so I'd like each group to share, please. So um, let's start with uh, this Nadia. group here, the young adult group here. <laughs> <Y 'all better laughs> <represent. Yeah. laughs> so like how last week we were talking about in John chapter 2 where Jesus did stuff purposefully so we can link one miracle to the other one so that it can confirm that he's God and that he did it that's exactly what Nicodemus did in this one he's declaring 
well, you're, you're Jesus because you couldn't do what you did without God being inside of you. Mm. So he recognized Jesus for who he was by what he did, which was the point of the last chapter. Okay, okay. okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Drop the mic. Drop the mic. <laughs> Drop the mic. Oh, no, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just one person can speak. I love it. Uh, Wade said, um, he said, Wade seems to be knowledgeable about him, but there's still some skepticism in the way he speaks to Jesus. Mm. Okay. okay. We, were, we were saying the same thing, that, you know, he's coming to him at night, he calls him teacher, and he comes from God, but doesn't actually call him God or the Son of God. So there's like some kind of skepticism, like what they were saying. Okay. Oh wow. And so, and one of the key things that they said there, I heard skepticism. I heard that he must be a person who's knowledgeable about God, but he shows up at night. Mm -hmm. He shows up at night, which tells you also a little bit about Nicodemus's character. He got a little shade in him. Okay. He's a, Pharisee. He's a Pharisee. You know, okay. he, he is a Pharisee. He's a high priest. Mm -hmm. So he himself has shrouded with people who have doubt. Or I don't even think that they doubt. I don't even think the word is doubt. Mm -hmm. They don't want to accept that someone is higher than them. At least the Pharisees were. Because just because I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to learn about the Pharisees today, too. We're going to talk a little bit about the fact the that he are. himself is a high priest. He is reverent because he does realize he's talking to the highest. So he has a reverence, but he actually has a slight humility because he does, and he is aware of these miracles, and he knows that there's even someone higher than the one he's speaking to. But it's, so he, it's not like he's snubbing his, his, his nose, but he has a reverence for the presence of what the things he has done. Okay. But I don't, again, going back to that questionable sincerity, if you, if you look at parallelism, there are some other passages where you've got other Pharisees coming up to Jesus, oh, we know that you are great and awesome. And then they mm -hmm. throw this trick question to try to trap him. So it can be a false sense of, of uh, respect as well mm -hmm. in trying to build him up for some kind of fall because that's we see that elsewhere. Yeah, because in one translation it says God, what is it written? They sign that you do unless they have God's help. He's even saying, look, you may declare who you are, but you're not God. It's almost like he's separating them to a certain extent. Okay. So he's saying, you need help. You know, it's like, almost, it's like you said, almost implying something. Okay. Or, mm -hmm. or that, that eyebrow raise to see okay. what kind of response mm -hmm. right. he might possibly get down the road. Right. Or you could say, aha. Yeah. I want to believe you, but aha. Right. Kind of questioning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Natalie's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to touch on, you know, when he came by night because of, um, could it be that he didn't want anyone to see him? Because we truly, yeah, shady, um, yeah. huh? He's doing well, the Pharisees. He doesn't want the Pharisees to see exactly. exactly. But is it shady or that he knows, he understands that this is Jesus, but he doesn't want the other Pharisees to know that he's accepting that this is Jesus? Or question it, or, or about to, as they say, turn to the other side, okay. or has turned. That's why he's coming That's in. That's shady. Okay. He's an undercover. Yeah, he's, he's undercover. undercover. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, what if he, uh, he's undercover. <laughs> he was just going to see for himself, like he didn't believe that this was Jesus, and he going to see for himself. He want to go find out and see for himself. Mm -hmm. Or protect himself. Like, okay. what do you say, he, he would get chastised or something? Okay. For even going to see him. Like, okay. there's a issue with even visiting, mm -hmm. being around him. But right? I also think he knew because it would be the Holy Spirit who would direct him because he, he, you know, he said, Rabbi, you know, he came to Jesus and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher came from God. Mm -hmm. And that means he, he is connected to the Holy Spirit. And I think he knows, but at the same time, he come by night because later down to in the scriptures, it taught when, when, you know, when God was saying the evil men like to do things at night and those of Christ would like, I'm paraphrasing right here, but later down it talks about evil, the evil men like the night 
And if you if you like heaven, you like day, you know, the good man like day, you know, I paraphrase it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it could be that I believe the Holy Spirit had he on he knew and he was trying to do it. I don't even use want to use words sneaky, but I'm gonna leave that up to the teacher. Okay. I'm passing the mic. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so and I agree with what all of you are saying. There's some skepticism here mm -hmm. because although he has the spirit of God and he, he's a Pharisee, mm -hmm. which if, let's think about the Pharisees for a second here. What can you tell me about the Pharisees? The Pharisees we know are people who are what? Very high order religious people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They believe in the strict order, the strict law of Moses. They also believe in the oral language of Moses. So whatever came out of Moses' mouth, they believed and they lived to that high standard. Now they may not always have lived to that high standard, mm -hmm. but they wanted to hold everybody else to that high standard. So the Pharisees had a strict belief in the law, the written law, and the oral language of Moses. Anything that was said from Levitical law, they believed it from the beginning. Anything that Moses stated that God said, they believed it from the beginning. And they felt that there was, had to be a strict order of how people lived, how they act. You couldn't touch certain things. You couldn't do certain mm -hmm. things. You couldn't go certain places. You had to stay in certain locations. So they had a specific structure and a specific order. They felt that your appearance, and this is going to be important for how we study this chapter, right? Mm -hmm. They felt that appearance mattered. They felt that how you were, what you, who you were born into, the family you were born into, that mattered. They felt that how you received teaching and training, that mattered. They felt that how you conducted yourself and how you followed the traditions mattered. I want you to notice, and I'm going to use this word traditions again. Notice what Jesus Christ, God is so smart <laughs> and he's so purposeful because in this chapter he's going to, he doesn't, the funny thing is when you look at the order of the book of John, he doesn't start talking first to the Samaritan woman who everybody says is, you know, she had the extra husband. She's below, she's the bottom of the barrel. Who does he go to first? The religious leaders. Mm -hmm. So in the layout of John, he goes directly to the religious leaders. And it's important for us to see that because as we look at this, when he begins to break down how they understand structure and tradition and order in relation to God, it will help us to see why, as he had to bring them down, he then made his way to those who were on the lower level and said, now, because I brought down this order, I'm going to now show you why this, me, and Jesus Christ and God, is now what you should be receiving, not the traditional law. So he breaks down their structure on purpose so he can introduce himself. Isn't God smart? <laughs> so let's look at how he breaks down. So Nicodemus... They said Nicodemus, now he was not one of the major uh, uh, hardcore players of the Pharisees, meaning that they said that he had a little bit, of, they said there was a hardcore ones, Pharisees, and then there were some who weren't as hardcore. Meaning when we say they're not hardcore, he wasn't one, although he held to the traditions, he was willing to uh, balance and watch miracles. He was willing to hold to the teachings of the law more than the structure and saying you have to wear this, you have to wear that, you have to do this, you have to do that. He was more concerned with how you follow the teaching, and that's why he was considered to be the master teacher, because his focus was teaching. It wasn't on how people uh, carried themselves or conducted themselves as far as their behavior. So Nicodemus had a little bit of, thank you, Nadia, and we'll come back to the board in a second. Nicodemus had some of this in him. So if we take that in our mind, right, and we go down to verse 3, it said, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All of you who said he had some skepticism, now watch here how Nicodemus, because uh, Dana said in the beginning, she said, oh, well, it sounds like Christ is conversing with him a lot. This chapter sounds like conversation. Nicodemus said what unto him? How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother womb and be born? Right? So Nicodemus is now like backing up. Wait a minute, right? I love how Christ begins to answer him. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. He's telling Nicodemus, I don't want you to be concerned with me telling you these specific words, you must be born again. I want you to read behind what it is that I'm actually saying. Because Nicodemus is hung up on the fact that, 
flesh cannot go back into the stomach. Mm -hmm. Flesh cannot go back into the womb. Listen to how, what Christ says to him. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell when it's cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said, answered and said unto him, How can these things be? What's Christ's response? <laughs> this I busted out laughing. <laughs> me too. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, Someone like read this out loud for me. <laughs> Who wants to read it? Go to the chat. I like ten. <laughs> yes. Um, verse ten. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Now let's pause right there. <laughs> Why would Christ fire back at Nicodemus such a way? Okay, talk with the person next to you. What in the teachings? Remember, because this group is the New Testament group. They had the Old Testament writings, meaning they had the Law of Moses, they had the Book of Isaiah, they had all of the prophets, all the prophecies, they had David, they had Psalms, they had all the Old Testament scriptures. What is Jesus talking about then? Because remember, Nicodemus' exchange here is, how could a person go back into the womb? But what prophecies did they have up until this point that causes Jesus to respond to him in such a way? Talk to the person with you. Okay, okay. let's share out. Who wants to jump in? Whichever group wants to jump in first. I heard a lot of great conversation. I, I hear a shot. I, I know Charlotte. the Paul like conversation. <laughs> 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 she understands the Nicodemus. I said, this is your night. <laughs> <laughs> like you. Yeah, he's causing all kinds of situations. <laughs> Extra credit time with Jesus. That's what See, he's and that's okay. exactly okay. what he's doing. Okay. Go ahead, Sharon. Go ahead, Sister Sharon. Okay, I think that Jesus is upset with him because, one, he's the master teacher, and he's supposed to know. But then when he initially approached Jesus... And what is he supposed to know? He is supposed... Scriptures. He's what scriptures? To, before, he, before, before... All the miracles that have applied before, prior to this. Before this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what you he, talked about, which are the laws of Moses, and the things that were stated in the um, prophecies. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he, he's saying, you should know these things. You live by them so strictly, and you don't know them, but yet you profess to be this high priest. And, and remember, why did they prophesy of him? To, boom. Because what did um, Isaiah say? There should be a, uh, somebody who's going to come out of it, and that he shall rule the governor, right? You guys hear this all the time during the Christmas plays. And he shall be counselor, prince of peace, you know? Uh, you guys hear that all the time from these Christmas plays that they do, right? So, and the government shall be on his shoulder. You know, we know this. Right now, this yeah. is what, yeah, Isaiah, that's right. We've heard it from the book of mm -hmm. Isaiah. You've heard it all the time. So Nicodemus should know these things, right? What are some other things that he should know that I heard you guys talking about? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> Morgan, you talk. Oh, no? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Sister Agnes. Did you raise your hand, or are you a victim? Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't just one group. You so whatever like Dan said, we all said. <laughs> <laughs> the book of Dan and the book of Dan. Those are us. We were just saying that you know he should know the scriptures and the, and the prophecies and the meaning behind them. You know, being a master teacher, he wasn't we would call the common folk, you know, I mean, he was, this is what they did, they study these, so, I mean, it's kind of what we discussed, but um, he should know the deep meanings behind all these things. And, I mean, it can be, it can be argued that uh, the Holy Spirit hadn't been revealing the true meaning behind them, maybe they were reading what they wanted to read out of it, uh, but Jesus is saying, you should understand this. Well, I think even as it goes further down, it talks about, you know, it's kind of like Jesus is like, look, um, you even know about these miracles happen, happening, but yet you still have an issue. You just basically have an issue with everything. Because even if I tell you something <laughs> happened on the earth right now, you're still questioning it. Mm -hmm. What's your problem? Mm -hmm. Which takes us down to verse 12. Exactly. Mm -hmm. If I've told you earthly things and you believe not, how should you right. believe if I tell you heavenly yeah. things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man lift it up. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. For God, and here's where our scripture most quoted from, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting 
life. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're going to pause right there. I would say, in my belief, uh, you know, leading into that, that when I was, I was reading it and I just reread it, I think if you take the tone of the conversation from Jesus, to me it's implied that Nicodemus isn't converted or doesn't choose uh, conversion. It seems like throughout the tone, Jesus is talking to him as one who will eventually condemn Jesus. So even though he might be kind of on the fence and maybe he is kind of thinking, yeah, I'm in, and am I out, that the appearances, sake of appearances and whatever else seems like, you know, even Jesus treats him like, look, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have to be lifted up, put on a cross. It's already prophesied and really implying you should know these things mm-hmm, throughout mm-hmm. the conversation and saying that's just the way it's going to be. But he's, he's kind of talking to him as someone on the other side. Absolutely, mm-hmm. and I agree. And Sister Chan's going to speak in a minute. But when I go right here, when I think of teacher, I think Nicodemus is so tied to the fact that he's a Pharisee. And we could even segue into the world. Don't forget your thoughts, Sister Sharon. We could even segue into the world. Sometimes people are so attached to the things of the world, it's hard for them to see the things that are spiritual. It's hard for them to see the things that God is actually speaking to them. It seems like things that are over their head. In reality, Christ looks at them and says, no, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you've experienced me. Mm-hmm. You know me. It's just that you're so tied up with what your traditions, you're tied up with your law, you're tied up with the fact that you're a master teacher over the Jews and a ruler of the Jews. You're also tied up with your knowledge because what can kill us? Knowledge. Mm-hmm. Knowledge is what kills us. The love of money is the root of all evil. But knowledge kills us, right? Because once we know certain things, you know, and, and Christ talks to us about that, and that's what happens with Nicodemus. He's so caught up in the fact that he is, that he knows as a Pharisee, he sees things through the eyes of a Pharisee. Although he sees the truth of what Christ is saying, he's still vacillating back and forth and teeter-tottering. Mm-hmm. He's teeter-tottering back and forth and asking Christ questions. And Christ is not attacking him. If you, if you notice when Christ is talking to him, Christ is not talking to him. I, I love what Brother Dan said. He's not talking to him based on what Nicodemus is saying. He's talking to him based on Nicodemus's heart. So that's mm-hmm. how Christ is going at him. Mm-hmm. Because if Nicodemus was thinking something different, Christ would have responded something different and say, Oh, Nicodemus, you're just a little confused. I understand, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I, I can't wait till we get further on and look at some other people in scripture. Whenever we go to Christ, I love, um, when I was growing up, my mom was always used to tell me, you better repent because when you stand before God, he's gonna help, expect you to say the truth and you're gonna have to say the truth and you're not gonna be able to lie before him. So you better tell me the truth now. That's how she got me to tell her the truth all the time. <laughs> it was good, she was good and she was really good. And so, so, um, it's the truth. When you stand before Christ, you can't lie. Because even if you try to come, kind of wiggle your way out, Christ knows that when he responds back to you, he responds based on the truth of what's really going on with you. Mm-hmm. You know? He, he, you, it's just like coming to the altar. You may go up for one thing and Christ says, yeah, I'm going to pray for that, but this is what I really want to address. Right? <laughs> this is what I really want to address. And that's how uh, Christ is with Nicodemus. He knows Nicodemus' heart. And he knows that Nicodemus is vacillating between what he knows as a Pharisee and tradition and law and what he's seen in the miracles. Because that's really what the true problem is. Nicodemus sees the miracles. He knows what he's seeing must be Christ because he himself said only God could do something like this. But then he starts asking all these crazy questions about where did you come from? Well, the same book of Isaiah told you that this person's going to come born of a virgin Mary. You know that Jesus Christ standing here was born of the virgin Mary, a woman named Mary. A woman who said she was a virgin. A woman who you all know she was a virgin because she didn't get with Joseph. You had to believe and choose to walk in that. So So he recognized his his conflict is what you're saying? Hmm? He he recognizes Nicodemus. Jesus recognizes recognizes Nicodemus' conflict. Mm -hmm. Nicodemus, I I believe, here's my personal belief, I believe Nicodemus went up to Jesus confused, but he also was slanting towards what he knew and what he believed. Although he saw physically what was in front of him, he wanted Christ to help him piece all of what he's seen together instead of jumping out in belief. Because remember, the whole point of what Christ did was to get people to understand and believe that he was who he said he was. That's the whole book of John is is, is tackling that belief, that first part of John, signs and miracles and belief. So when Christ came to them, that's what's his purpose. Whereas Nicodemus is like, okay, I'm seeing you doing all of these things, And although I know that you probably are Christ, 
I'm not too sure because of what I know in my traditional law. He wasn't willing to believe. And Christ is tackling belief. You with me? Mm -hmm. So Christ is tackling something that he didn't choose yet to believe. I think verse 11 says it all. I think it says, most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. So it's basically saying mm -hmm. to Nicodemus, you come to me and you tell me, if you, you know, you showed, you have, you did all these signs and now you're questioning me. So it's like you've seen it and you're doing nothing with it. So, exactly. Or you're choosing not to do anything with it. You receive not our testimony, our witness. Right. It's like someone sitting in, I like how you brought it up, Sister Sharon, someone sitting on the jury and the judge, you had the uh, person sitting on the bench and they said, I saw Sister Agnes doing cartwheels. You know, and the person sitting there saying, I saw them do it. And you say, well, did you really see that? You know, what do you believe it was Sister Agnes? It could have been somebody else. Was she really set, you know, to do cartwheels? You know, that's the kind of thing that they were saying. He's a true witness. He's seen the miracles. And the thing is, it's funny because Nicodemus didn't say, I read about the miracles. He said he witnessed the miracles. <laughs> so you witnessed it. So let's move on. If I told you earthly things, you guys read that. Let's go down to verse 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven, and as Moses lifted up the servant. We read that part. Let's move down to verse 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You saw the same information in verse 15 that you see in verse 16. God repeats himself twice, right? Mm -hmm. He says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him, and God talks about belief again. Mm -hmm. Christ talks about belief again. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he had not believed in the name of the Holy Son begotten of God. Mm -hmm. There's no way around it. People who do not believe in Jesus, they are already condemned because they choose not to believe in Jesus. Jesus already states that right there. I want you to notice, because before we transition over to talk about John, the, um, John the Baptist, when you go to verse 19, it says, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. Who's the light he's talking about? Jesus. Jesus has come into the world, and men love, this is the scripture Sister Dawn was talking about, yeah. men love what? Darkness. Rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Mm -hmm. People love to live in the dark, right? Mm -hmm. They'd rather not know the truth, because they don't necessarily want to be set free, right? <laughs> don't tell me the truth about myself, because then that means I'm going to have to change. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. What does reproved mean? Change. But he that doeth truth comes to light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. I want to stop there just for a second. What did Jesus tackle in that whole exchange with the Pharisees? What did he then at this point, this Pharisee Nicodemus, what are some things in here that he tackled? His belief one. He tackled his belief one, and the belief is what? What is Nicodemus' belief to this point? The tradition. Well, the, uh, the traditional law, right? Mm -hmm. That says that you have to come through, uh, go through the priest, get cleansed, uh, follow this specific order. He, he's tackling that, right? He's tackling the fact that you can't live this life through the flesh, that you have to live it through the what? The spirit. spirit. Through the spirit. So anybody who says that I don't want to deal with the spirit, the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. is not living a life that, that Christ is saved. Mm -hmm. He said in order, to, in order to live this life, Nicodemus, you're going to have to be born of the spirit. He said the only way to be born of the spirit is through what? Water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Born again. Born again, mm -hmm. born again. And he said being born again through believing that Jesus Christ and accepting Christ into your heart. And when you're born again, he said, when you believe and you're born again and you accept Christ into your life, at that point he says, you're now believing in the spirit. He's believing God the Father, you're believing the spirit who will make that change, right? So this tackles all of those traditional things that the Pharisees had put up. All the blocks and all of the walls that the Pharisees had put up for other people to not be able to come. Because remember, in the eyes of everybody, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they all believed that, that everybody else, except for them, were a holy order. Right? Jesus took down their holy order. And he said, basically, 
anyone who wants to just believe that Christ is born of, of the uh, Virgin Mary, and anyone who wants to believe that I am the Son of God, and anyone who wants to believe that they can just accept me in their life, and they will be born again, and they will be changed, he made it very simplistic. Mm -hmm. So he took down this structure that's been built up for so long. Okay? Any comments? But as, as because the, the belief again is going to come up like in later way down scripture. Absolutely. Because when you know, it, I think it's I think it's sixteen. Yeah. Chapter sixteen. When God talks about blessed are those, you know, blessed are those who have not seen but yet, yet believe. Yeah. So, and I'm thinking what I'm thinking, but um, Nicodemus here, what's keep popping in my mind is, is like you know you can have a minister preacher who's preaching the word of God and teaching people, and You've, you've gone to, like, you know, it could be crusades or whatever, you've seen that God and miracles happen, you know. It's like, for example, when we went to Guyana, we see God deliver a, couple, a lot of people in our trip to Guyana. And yet you can still have some people who have seen all these things, but it's something internal. They still don't believe or still choose not to serve Christ, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And when God was talking as their teacher, mm -hmm. and you you know you haven't known these things, it's like I'm saying because it goes back to God sees your heart. Mm -hmm. It's like giving God lip service. It's like oh I'm worshiping, I'm doing all these things, but deep down in the heart, you are not doing it. You're just saying these things. That's where you know you have like the false prophets and the false teachers mm -hmm. out there that's leading people, mm -hmm. and but deep down within their heart, they're doing total. You know, I'm yeah. still having questions. Yeah. It's like you saying, like, because I'm telling Sharon, you know, uh, Jesus is real, but in the back of my mind, I'm questioning, yeah, is he yeah. really for real? Yeah. You know, so that's the vision I'm getting out of this right here. This conversation. You know, in yeah. terms of yes, he wants, he probably he wants to, but he still have doubts, mm -hmm. and that's why he's saying God is speaking to the heart because God speaks. You know, he speaks to the heart and the main of man. Reason for, exactly. And the main reason he has doubts is because he refuses to release mm -hmm. his traditional law. Yeah. And that's usually where the key is. The reason why people struggle in their relationship with God is because they refuse to release something. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the key thing there. You know, we, we, it wouldn't be... Um, Remember things Sister Dana told me, her and I had these conversations all the time. She said God always tells her um, the part, there's some things that are complex about God, but serving him is simplistic. The service to him is simplistic, mm -hmm. but we make it complicated. Mm -hmm. We make it complicated because we don't release the things he tells us to release. That's true. And when we don't release the things he tells us to release, that's what makes it complicated. And that's the key thing with him. So God literally tackled this. When we, we're going to, next week is going to be interesting too because when we make the comparison between Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman and some of the other people who we're going to come up against, you're going to see that God doesn't address the same things that he addresses with Nicodemus. You know, this structure that God is talking about is a major structure that has to be brought down because this goes into how people become religious and how they serve God instead of basing their service to God on the belief and the love that God has with mm -hmm. them and the relationship. God tackle all of the structure and the uh, religiosity of serving God with the relationship. God wants us to work on a relationship with him, just like a husband and a wife. Has. Sharon always prays in the prayer line, God bless the marriages in our church. She's always praying, can we remember the marriages of our church? God wants us to work on our relationship, our marriage relationship with him, the way he wanted Nicodemus to understand that what I'm talking to you about, I'm not talking about just being a part of you serving me as a master, I'm talking about getting inside of you. I'm talking about this relationship. I'm talking about being born in the spirit. I'm talking about some things that uh, intermingling my spirit with your spirit. I'm talking about specifically getting to the spirit of man with the spirit of God. I'm talking about some intertwining. I'm talking about the intimacy, that undercover stuff. And I don't mean negative undercover stuff. I'm talking about mm -hmm. bed undercover stuff. I'm talking about those things that God wants to intermingle with man and develop that relationship with him. Those are the things that he was digging up with Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. And those are things that he wanted him to see. Who had the hand up? Someone? I was just going to say, sometimes I think I can speak for me. Sometimes I think we are like Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. It's like God shows us, we, you know, we may go through a struggle and we have miracles or we see God's miracles coming through. The next struggle that comes up, 
you know, it's like you're wondering, okay, is God with me? Or it's like sometimes we, I think, show some of Nicodemus's traits because it's like you you've seen the signs and you know God is there, you know He's with you, and you know you know you know the scriptures, but then you forget mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. you choose not to believe in certain during some times of a struggle or you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just saying. Yeah, no, I agree. With you. I agree. You, you, and you do forget, you, you know, forget, because yeah. because the world um, starts putting you in a organization box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we start working within the world organization box, and sometimes God's box doesn't look as organized as God's world box, mm -hmm. as the world box. Because mm -hmm. the world box mm -hmm. looks direct. The world box doesn't look clumsy. God's box kind of looks a little clumsy at mm -hmm. times, but in reality it's not clumsy. It's because we have to tackle those things with right. faith. The world sets up their orders and their structures, and it seems like the world has it going on. It seems like they know what they're doing mm -hmm. in the way they set up businesses, and the way they organize money, and the way they organize. It's, it's, and what I'm talking about, let me bring it to money, and money's just a small piece, but there's other things. Um, Sister Dawn's a financial person. So we can talk about, well, in the world structure, it seems smart to set aside money for retirement. It seems smart to set aside money for um, savings. It seems smart to to set aside a certain percentage of your paycheck for uh, insurance. If something happens to you, it seems smart to set aside money to save and, and pay for certain things. But in the financial structure that God has, take off 10% first. Mm -hmm. Now take that 90% and then set up these structures. Mm -hmm. God's way seems clumsy. It seems irresponsible. It seems weird to take a large chunk of my check, give it to him, and try to live off of this. God's system seems clumsy. But in reality, his system's not clumsy because he's talking about the intimacy of trusting and relationship with him. And he's trying to get people to understand if you mix with my structure, you'll really find there's where the real abundant life is. Mm -hmm. That's where the real, that's what I'm talking about. But it's not clumsy. It's not because it's not clumsy. that 10% that and more is going into your heavenly retirement yes. and your savings that you don't Hev even know. Heavenly and, yes, heavenly <laughs> retirement and God has even shown me there are things that he does that <laughs> he has a way of just swi side swiping and saying, okay, good, here comes something on the side. It's just an earthly thing. I'm going to open up this door. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to work for it because you already laid the foundation a while ago. So this and what, is coming and what, here. And what's the key word in all that? It goes back to right there, belief. Belief. You got to believe in him and believe that his system is going to work. And, and belief works. in him comes through that relationship. Exactly. And that's what he Can wants. I give you guys an example? Yes. Um, someone... Uh, last week, someone came back to the finance office and told me, you know, they wanted to give more. They want to come up to giving their 10%. Um, I would never tell anyone how much to give, but they wanted to give 10%. And you said, they said, they, from the, what they're looking at, they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So I said to the person, you know what, just pray about it. If that's on your heart, you give it, and I promise you, God will take you through the week, and you will not have a problem. That person came to me yesterday and said to me that they did what I said and they had no, the money that they gave, was, that, that they had given that week, was all given back to them. There was no stress, Amen. no worry. So it was just, God gives, I mean, it, just the faith. If you believe and you do it, mm -hmm. he gives it back. So. And I agree with that. I added it and hope Sister Sharon's going to jump in. Uh, oh, six minutes. Four minutes, five minutes. <laughs> she's my timekeeper. See what she's doing to me, guys? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, just a little sidebar, too. I agree. I had amped my um, tithes. I get the same amount literally every week, but I amped it up by $10. And uh, I said, okay, God, you know, I said, I'm going to amp this up, not expecting anything. Because when I get to God, I, I like to give because I love him because I want to see his work done and not because there's an expectation for a return. So I said, I'm just going to amp this up because I want to see your work get done, and I know the church needs it. So I did that. The next week, it seemed like I was down to a dollar in my account. And I was like, okay, God, I gave this extra 10. Please help me. I'm not expecting anything in return because I didn't give this for a return, but please help me. So I began to have uh, you know, people treating me and uh, taking me out and doing these different things. And I'm like, ooh, this is nice, Lord. You know, and then, then next thing I know, um, then I had an overflow mm -hmm. of resources come in. And that overflow of resources, I was like, ooh, that was nice. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what I'm saying is that God has a way of just letting you have a, 
extra overflow resources. It's not always the way that you think it's going to come, right, exactly. but he always mm -hmm. just takes care of us, his people. And it's not always perfect or it doesn't seem perfect, mm -hmm. but he always makes it perfect. Absolutely. It, it always turns out. To it be always turns out be, to be perfect. Since our timekeeper took us down to four minutes, let's breeze through real fast. <laughs> After these things came Jesus and his disciples to the land of Judea, and then he tarried with them and baptized. I thought this part was interesting, because watch here. John also was baptizing. So watch, Jesus and John are both baptizing at the same time. Did that seem odd to you? Did it stand out to you? Jesus and John are both baptizing at the same time. Jesus is baptizing his disciples, uh, uh, Jesus and disciples into the land of Judea, and they baptized, and then verse 23, and John also was baptizing in Anon near Selim, where because there was much water there. John went where there was a lot of water, and people came and were baptized. Uh, and scripture, John, the book of John, now the author John, who's different than John the Baptist, mm -hmm. the author John says, for John was not yet cast into prison, because he wants to make a note for people who may have read the other gospels, mm -hmm. John wasn't thrown yet into prison when he was baptizing, mm -hmm. okay? Because Mark and Luke um, record it as John also was thrown into prison. They talk about him being thrown into prison. He makes a note to say this hadn't happened yet. Verse 26, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about prophesying, uh, purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man received nothing except it be given him from heaven. Mm -hmm. Ye yourself bear with me witness that I said, I am not Christ, mm -hmm. but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, the, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth <coughs> and hear of him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. That's where I want to stop right there, okay? And I like that. I like this part, and this is where I want to end our discussion. Verse 32 to 36 is awesome, but I want to talk here at this, these two parts here, from verse 28, um, actually from verse 24 up to 32, and this is where we're going to close out. When you all look at these, this chapter, he says, John says, I must decrease. So what was the Jews trying to do? The people who were being baptized by John the Baptist, why were they getting John in a, a, a talk conversation, Morgan. Why were they? Why were they uh, telling? What were they telling John? <laughs> what were they telling John the Baptist? What was John the Baptist doing? Baptizing. He was baptizing people exactly, and he was baptizing people at the same time as who? Jesus. So the people who were being baptized by John were running to John the Baptist and saying, "But Jesus is doing the same thing that what?" Yes, that John is doing. Mm -hmm. They were trying to get him all and you, were doing it first. Hmm? And you were, and you were doing it first. You were doing it first, mm -hmm. exactly. What does Christ tackle here? Because remember, everything Christ does is purposeful and systematic, and he included this in scripture for a reason. What was he trying to get people to understand? Christ or John the Baptist. What was Christ trying to get? What was God's intention? And this, what do you think God's intention was? What was Christ trying to get across here? Because John says it. What does he say? What does he say? In verse. That, uh, that he, oh, in verse 30. The decrease but increase. So the transition. Absolutely. He told them, he said, remember that, uh, yeah, I'm baptizing just like Jesus is baptizing. Mm -hmm. However, I came to be a witness mm -hmm. for God. I didn't come to have my own uh, place here. I didn't come to have my own thing. And although I'm doing exactly what he's doing, I'm pointing you to this is the person, this is the leader, this is the person who's in charge. You know, I'm bringing myself down so that you all can understand that Christ should be exalted. What does this speak to about our country, our nation, where we are? We are at a place right now, I see Brother Dan with his hand up, we're at a place right now where we have to make sure that we do not get puffed up the way that the world does. Mm -hmm. That we have the point when we begin, I'm telling you, when God begins to do miracles through us and God begins to operate through us, we have to make sure that we constantly are walking in humility and saying that this is not us. This is Christ himself. This is God himself. 
you know, he's the one who's doing this miracle. He's the one who's having his way. He's the one who gets the glory. He's the one who gets the praise. That's why it's important that when we are out there in the world and things happen that are crazy, that we still demonstrate that God is still in control. Because as long as we get puffed up and we get arrogant and we get mad and we get feisty and we carry ourselves in a certain way, that is going to cause people to say, wait a minute, you're the one who's increased. Where's Christ in all of this? Mm -hmm. You know? But when you begin to decrease and say, well, God is in control. I serve the Almighty Father. He's the King of Kings and He's the Lord of Lords. He takes authority over everything. I am not myself. I'm not my own. He can handle this country. He can handle this world. Greater is He that's in us than He that's in this mm -hmm. world. You begin to start pointing people back to Christ, and then we begin mm -hmm. to start, people will begin to start seeing Christ, which is who they should have seen all along. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep which is who people see all along. And that is the importance of John's witness. Brother Dan? I'm actually going to jump ahead here, but something I find interesting is even though John has the right idea here and he's saying, look, you know, I've got to decrease, he's going to increase, he's the one I'm pointing to, later after he's in prison, prison he starts to get then, to yeah, then he sends to the disciples, hey, are you really the Christ or should we look for another? You know, after he starts, I mean, he's human. So as he starts enduring the hardships of prison and all that stuff, you know, doubt starts to creep in even with him. And he's, mm -hmm. he's the forerunner of Christ. He's the forerunner of Christ. Yeah. He still has doubt. So. I can't wait to get to that. You can't yeah. blame Nicodemus. Yeah, see? Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Which God, Christ tackles all of that, you know? Christ tackles all of those periods, those pieces of, and everything that every human being did in those chapters, we can see that. We all deal with that too, and how Christ handled and tackled all of those. Any final comments? We're at 8:30, are we? Hmm? 8:30. 8:34. 8:34. Oh. Wait, Sorry. Five, five, five. Five. <laughs> <laughs> Any final comments? Let's Great go ahead. discussion. Amen. Great discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you.